All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, and and today we're going to be talking about, uh, again, growing with the giants, right? We're going to see what we can learn from uh, the people of faith, and uh, we're doing kind of a topical type uh, survey of some of these uh, giants that we find, not giants in terms of stature, but uh, giants in terms of their faith. And uh, we can learn from them. And can I, let me just say this too, that these giants, quote unquote, are not any more gigantic than you or I per se. These were the men and the women that God chose to use and uh, because they were available to be used. Heard one person say that, that uh, as, as, as ironic as this is, that uh, God is not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. He's looking for pliability, and he's looking for dependability. To me, I, I find that encouraging, because if you fall into that category of being available, being pliable, and being dependable, God, will use you. God can use you. Now, God can also use you for a bad example as well, which God forbid. But we, we possess something that, uh, that these giants of the faith didn't necessarily possess. Back in the Old Testament, they had the Holy Spirit come upon them and, and empower them to do these wonderful things we see in Scripture. But you know what's interesting? We have the Holy Spirit within us empowering us, not just coming upon us, but actually indwelling within us. And we have a remarkable Holy Spirit, part of the triune Godhead, and I'm thankful for that. By way of some introduction, let me say this about Genesis 50. I want to look real quickly at the, the behavior of, of these individuals, of these, of these, let's call them reprobates, uh, before the righteous. Look at Genesis chapter 50, and let me read just a few verses beginning in verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren, and their sins, and their sin rather, for they did evil unto uh, for they did unto the evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when he spake unto them. In verse 18, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. I want you to notice just real quickly the attitude of these men. It was a broken attitude. It was a, a broken spirit. They have done evil, and we remember this from the story of Joseph. They had done evil. They sold his brother Joseph, this Joseph, into slavery. They, there was an attempt basically to try to kill him. And then he said, you know what? Let's just sell this guy off into, into slavery. And then the whole history of, of uh, we see in Joseph was uh, this, this uh, tragedy, really, when it comes to this um, uh, being sold into slavery. And, then, and then, that, then he is accused of his of his boss's wife, of a crime he did not commit, and, and then he goes into prison and then is forgotten about, and all of this tragedy. And, uh, and yet now when they come, when these brethren come to Joseph, in Genesis 50, they're broken. And I just want to ask a, a simple question. Are you, are you a broken person? Do you have a broken and contrite spirit about you? Do we act in humility? Do we act in humility? Listen, we've wronged people. And do we come to them and say, hey, listen, we, we haven't been maybe the, the, the people that we should be. And do you act in brokenness? Or are you a proud person? Are you a proud person? Are you puffed up? Martin Luther said that God made the world out of nothing and it is only when we become nothing that God can make something out of us. Are you a broken person? 
Are you a humble person before God? Because that is the posture of these men. A broken individual that they have sinned and done wrong before this individual. Let's look at two things this morning about how do we grow this year. How do we grow this year? First of all, number one, believe in your place. Believe in your place. That is to say, know that you are where you should be. Know that you are where you should be. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 and 20, it says this, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for I am in, for, for I am in the place of God. Verse 20, But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass that is, as it is this day to save much people alive. First of all, let's look at this. This is a, a great uh, point here. You cannot beat the place of God. You can't beat the place of God. As a matter of fact, the place of God and the pace of God, don't ever try to outrun God. He'll beat you, by the way. The place of God and the pace of God have everything to do with the peace of God. Are you where God has you to be? And up until this point, this, this awful tragedy, these awful tragedies that come along Joseph's way, and he still in Genesis 15 is able to say, but I, I'm in the place of God. And now how many of us have gone through trials and situations in our own personal lives, on a personal level have gone through trials and still had said, at the end of those trials, said, but, but am I in the place of God? Yes, I am in the place of God. I am exactly where God wants me to be. You know, I, I tell you, Joseph, when, when he rose to power, he could have, he could have probably changed his direction. He, he could have changed his direction. I, I, I'm quite certain. It doesn't say it in the Bible, but I'm certain of it. Let me ask you a question. You could probably be anywhere right now. It's true. It's true. None of us have committed a crime, per se, that would keep us in this very room, in this very city, in this very state, in this very country. You probably have some ability to, to move about the country, per se. Though you've gone through some tragedy, just like maybe, not quite like Joseph. I mean, that's, this is pretty heavy tragedy. But you probably have some ability to move across the, the, the globe a little bit. And can you say to yourself, I am in the very place of God right now. Despite all the tragedies, despite what's going on around us, can we say, I am in the place of God. I'm exactly where I need to be because God placed me here. So number one, you cannot beat the place of God. And number two, that God uses evil to bring about good. Now, this is a great question. How in the world does God use evil things to bring about something that's going to be beneficial? And, and, and I'm not talking about using sinners either, friends. Of course, God's going to use sinners, but we're talking actual evil here. We're talking about something that had this, like, a, a premeditation about it. Like, we say, well, God, 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 will use, God will use the bad. It's true. But I, I think there is a difference between bad and between evil and wickedness. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's like this escalation. Listen, we're all sinners, and God's going to use every one of us on some level. But what I'm simply saying is that in this case, God used this evil, this wickedness, to bring about some good. So all of the things we, we look around the world and we say, man, that is just wicked. Can, can God use an Adolf Hitler to bring about some good? Yes, he can. Can God use the evil things that we see around us right now? Can God use the evil and the wickedness to bring about good? He sure can. Does he cause them? No, he does not. But can he use it? He, sure, he certainly can. And he'll use it for good. So believe that you are, in fact, in the place of God. And that all of those things that are happening around us, God will bring to pass something good about it. Genesis chapter 45, 1 to 7. Genesis 45, 1 to 7. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. 
And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud in the Egyptians, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, who ye sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourself that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. What a perspective. What an amazing perspective. You might have sold me into slavery, but God sent me forth. You might have meant something evil, but God meant it for good. It goes on to say, for these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earring nor a harvest. And, verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. We might be in a trial, we might be in a tragedy, we might say to ourselves, well, this, this can't, this is, this, is, this is a hard thing that we're struggling with right now. This is a really tough thing. But we can say, you know what? Somebody else maybe have meant it for evil, but God sent us into this position to bring to pass something that's positive. Can you say that about maybe the, the trials, some of the struggles in your life? This is not just where God allowed Joseph to be, but actually placed him there, sent him forth to preserve. Is that how you feel about where you're at? Is that how you feel about where you're at? Do you believe in your place? Do you believe in your place that where you are is exactly where you ought to be? Are you as confident as, as, as Joseph was that he was in the place of God. And let me say this too. If you believe in your place, if you are absolutely certain that this is exactly where God has you to be, then give your all. I mean, trying to, trying to, is it like trying to live a lie almost. Like, well, I, I'm supposed to be in this place, but I'm just a little reserved or a little hesitant to just give my all. And, and we kind of dabble a little bit, don't we? We kind of try to dabble. We're not really, we, we want to say, we, it's like we're trying to convince ourselves, you know? I, I'm trying to convince myself that this is the place of God, that God sent me here to do this particular task, but I can't give my all because I'm not certain that this is where I need to be. How many of us have felt like that? In, in relationships, in jobs, and all sorts of things. You come to a job and you say, well, this is the job that God sent me to, to do, and yet at the same time, I, I'm not exactly sure that this is what God wants me to do. So you know what? You're hesitant. There's a, there's a reservation about giving your all where you're at because you don't really believe you're in your place. You don't really believe you're in the place that God has you to be. So we have to check that at the door. We have to believe in your place. And I tell you what, when we get to the place where we believe we are where we should be. We'll become giants of the faith. Because we'll be able to put forth 10x action. We'll be able to put forth tremendous amounts of activity and action because we absolutely believe that we are where God has us to be. So number one, how do we grow this year? Believe in your place. Believe in your place. Number two, what can we learn from Joseph? Joseph. How do we grow this year? Number two, behave with God's grace. Behave with God's grace. In Genesis 50, verse 21, it says this, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Behaving with God's grace. When someone does you wrong, you grow in grace. You grow in grace. In 2 Peter 3.18, we talked about this, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is hardly a better example in the Bible of somebody who displayed grace on somebody. Somebody would have said, well, yeah, but, but, but Joseph, 
could have just given the signal, you know? That means off with the head, by the way, if you're unfamiliar with that. This means off with the head. When the boys and I are mowing, we have kind of, uh, we have some hand signals. And, uh, and some of those hand signals are, are this. this. This means to fluff up the grass with a leaf blower. So, we're, so I might, it's all loud, and so this is the hand signal. And so they know, and I point, I say, there. Or this means around back, so fluff up around back, you know. So they get that, right? And uh, this means to, means to trim. So I might go like this, trim around the house, and they'll know. And so it's trim like this. We need to come up with numbers, like signals of numbers that don't seem so weird. Um, I, thought about, I thought about leaf blowing being this way. <laughs> but that really looks weird, you know. That's not really a, a, a normal hand signal. We thought about, you know, like the baseball players, they kind of, you know, do this. And then someone would know. They'd be like, wow, he's got a really itchy ear. He itches his nose and his ear and his eyebrow and all sorts of things. And uh, so we have his hand signal. So I tell you, Joseph, he could have just sat there. And he could have called in the Egyptians. He didn't have to call him away. He didn't have to send him away. He could have just sat there and went like this. You know? He could have said, these guys, off with their head and bury them. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's all he would. People would say he had every right. But you know what? He behaved with God's grace. And aren't you thankful that there are people out there like Joseph that behave with some of the greatest grace ever? These these brethren tried to kill him, in a sense. They, they sold him off into slavery. He had hardship most of his life because of them, and he probably had every right to just off with their head. And you know what? He didn't. He didn't. What do you do when someone does you wrong? Do you still love them? Joseph still loved him. How did, how did Joseph soothe their fears. How did Joseph soothe their fears? In verse 21, it says, Now therefore, fear ye not. He says, I will nourish you. I will nourish you and your little ones. How did he soothe their fears? He served them. Do you serve the people who do you wrong? Do you serve the people that do you wrong? Do you go out of your way to take care of them and their families? Do you say, hey, man, I know maybe you've done me wrong. And the world might look at it and say, yeah, he's got every right not to care, but you know what? I'm going to serve these people. How about this? This is a good one. He also spoke kindly to them. Do you go out of your way to speak kindly to people? Or are your words harsh? I, I know my words are not always as soft as they ought to be. Are your words as soft as they ought to be? How many of you have had to apologize because you hadn't had soft words? Anybody? Anybody have to go up to somebody and say, hey, man, my words just weren't what... I had to do that last night, didn't I, Josh? I came into Josh's bed and I said, hey, buddy, you know, just not as soft and tender as it should have been, and I'm sorry. Do Do you do that? Do you speak kindly towards people, especially when they've done you wrong? It's easy to speak softly and kindly to somebody when you've done them wrong, right? But how about when, you've, when they've done you wrong? Are you still soft and kind to them? Are you showing God's grace in the words that you speak and the way that you speak them? Because I got news for you. None of us are perfect. None of us are perfect. We're all going to struggle. We're all going to have our, our times of... Uh, of, uh, of sin in our life, and the question is, is you want people to deal with you the way, or <laughs> the way that God has dealt with us. He hasn't dealt with us with anger and a temper. He's dealt with us calmly in love. We spend our whole lives with people who do things they shouldn't do who say things they shouldn't say and who think things they shouldn't think. And are you going to be gracious to them? Because Joseph was. He was gracious. He was gracious. Are you asking for God's grace to be upon other people? Are you asking for God's grace to be upon other people? Numbers 624, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Is this your prayer for other people? 
when you depart from people, do you say that? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Do you want God to protect the people that maybe do you wrong? It goes on to say the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Do you say that to people? Are you growing this year? Are you behaving with God's grace? Number one, do you believe in your place? And then do you behave with God's grace? You see, we can grow this year, despite everything else around us maybe shrinking. We can grow spiritually. We can be an encouragement to people. We can be a blessing to them, even when they have done us wrong. Even when they have done us wrong. And the world might say it's justified for you to retaliate. It's justified for you to protest. It's justified for you to hate. It's not. It's not justified. It's not godly. You put your arm around people and say, man, you know what? Nobody's perfect. Let's move forward together. Let's grow in God's grace together. I hope you can say that. This all takes time. This all takes a tremendous amount of work. Let me say this just quickly in conclusion. For the most part, and there's always exceptions, none of what has happened to you has been as bad as what has happened to Joseph. There's always exceptions. We can always respond with grace. We can always be kind and tender to those people that do us wrong. We can always be soft. It doesn't mean not to be firm, but we can always be soft. Let's grow in grace together.